Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon to those of you in Europe right now. Welcome to the Project on Europe and the Transatlantic Relationship Seminar on a Green and Political Europe. I'm Erica Manicellis, and I have the pleasure of moderating this event with our three distinguished panelists today. Vivian Schmidt is the Jean Monnet Professor of European Integration and Professor of International Relations and Political Science in the Pardee School at Boston University. She's also an honorary professor at Louis University in Rome. Her most recent book is Europe's Crisis of Legitimacy, Governing by Rules and Ruling by Numbers in the Eurozone. Natalie Tochi is the Pierre Keller Visiting Professor at the Harvard Kennedy School this fall. She's also the director of the Instituto Affairi Internazionale in Rome, a special advisor to EU High Representative Joseph Borrell. And she's a member of EIN, ENI's Board of Directors. Formerly, she served as a special advisor to Federica Mogherini, where she wrote the European Global Strategy and worked on its implementation. Alexandro Sianis is currently Deputy Head of Policy Planning and Strategic Foresight in the EU's European External Action Service in Brussels. He worked with Javier Solana, the first EU High Representative for Common Foreign and Security Policy, and also worked as a member of the cabinet of Catherine Ashton, the former EU High Representative and Vice President of the Commission. Thank you all for being here today with us. I'd like to start with your collective impressions of COP26. Many activists and policymakers called the Glasgow Climate Pact disappointing because of the last minute change in language around facing down coal by India and China, and because of the lack of clear commitment to climate financing for developing countries to build cleaner energy and cope with increasingly extreme weather disasters. However, after the summit, most major economies have now pledged to reach net zero emissions by specific years. The US and EU by 2050, China by 2060, and India by 2070. So what did COP26 accomplish and what is left to be done on the global level? I'll start with Natalie. Well, thank you, Erica, and thank you for organizing this. Um, so I really think that in sort of looking at COP26, um, which is very obviously a story about a glass half full and a glass half empty, uh, the perspective that one has really depends on what, what the expectation was and, and what the benchmark is. Um, so if uh, the expectation is an improvement in terms of uh, implementation uh, from uh, Paris, then obviously it was a, a success. Uh, but if the expectation uh, was actually putting the world on track uh, for achieving uh, the Paris uh, goal, then uh, obviously it was not uh, such a great success. And perhaps kind of going a little bit uh, deeper into this, I, say, I think sort of um, elements that fall into the box of, uh, of the glass half full obviously have to do with the completion of the so-called uh, rule book uh, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, the completion, and this took many years, of negotiations of, uh, over Article 6, uh, which is basically the article that um, sets the ground rules for the establishment of carbon uh, markets, and this obviously could eventually uh, lead to a push uh, at the global level in terms of uh, carbon pricing as well, which is, and we'll come to the European Union, but this is obviously a very important uh, point for the European Union. Uh, there have always obviously been also stepped up uh, pledges um, before COP and after COP. Uh, this uh, sort of led to a uh, reduction of uh, the global temperature at, at which uh, we are set from a sort of 2.7 mark pre-COP to a 2.4 degree uh, mark uh, post and at uh, COP. I think perhaps even more importantly, uh, an agreement to review uh, these, uh, these pledges uh, next year. So in a sense, the sort of the sense of urgency and the ratcheting up of that sense of urgency uh, having been established at COP26. Um, fossil fuels being referred to for the first time, uh, both coal and uh, oil and gas. Uh, and then as far as uh, climate finance uh, is concerned, uh, the launch of a dialogue over the uh, incredibly thorny question of, of loss and damage, which is basically uh, compensation for uh, the historical injustice uh, that, that climate change represents, as well as the doubling, uh, particularly as far as funds for climate adaptation are concerned. 
Now, very clearly, there are then there's an equally long list uh, when it comes to the glass half empty. Um, as I mentioned earlier, yes, 2.7 is better than 2.2 or 2.4, but it's certainly still a long way away from 1.5. So if the expectation was, uh, as uh, Prime Minister Boris Johnson set out, uh, keeping 1.5 alive, well, very clearly COP26 uh, did not uh, hit that uh, target. Uh, likewise, yes, it may be good that fossil fuels are referred to for the first time, uh, but uh, as you were yourself, Erica, mentioning, uh, there is not a reference to the phasing out uh, of coal, but rather a phasing down of coal. Uh, and even fossil fuel subsidies are, are going to be are, are mentioned, uh, but with the expectation that only inefficient fossil fuel subsidies would be uh, would be removed. And then, of course, as far as climate finance. Uh, is concerned, um, we are nowhere near yet uh, the 100 billion uh, mark that was set out uh, in uh, Paris. Uh, we will probably get there over the next two, three, uh, four years time, depending on how you actually make the calculations. Um, and, and very clearly, the point is that even that 100 billion uh, per year in climate finance, it's becoming increasingly clear how even that is inadequate. Uh, and so we may be slowly edging towards that target, but the target itself is becoming increasingly clear how even that is insufficient. And let me just stop there. Thank you, Natalie. You covered a lot of ground already. So I'd like to ha uh, hand it over to Vivian. Uh, yeah, so Natalie, you've just about covered everything that I was going to say. So I'll keep my remarks very short and probably go on longer. Um, on the next question. But, you know, just in terms of my own impressions of the results of COP26, you know, it's at least something, it's not nothing, but it's surely not ambition, ambitious enough. Nonetheless, it's important to keep up the discussion and keep up the dialogue. One sees at least some progress um, and that's better than nothing. And of course, there are certain important things that Natalie has already mentioned, um, but the agreement to cut methane gas emissions by 30% is important. The Chinese US agreement on the reduction of fossil fuels is good, but of course it's vague and it's difficult to assess how significant that will be. Natalie already mentioned the historic mention now of the phase down of coal and the phase out of inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. You know, we wish it would have been phase out of coal as well, but you know, it's a pity that India and China uh, had their last minute intervention changing the language on coal from phase out. But you know, at least this is the first time that fossil fuel has been mentioned. So in many ways, this is really good. Um, and we've, at least there's movement closer as Natalie already also said to formally recognizing that the goal is to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, even though that's not really been formalized, I guess, but at least we've moved closer there. Um, the deal agreed on Saturday on the trading of carbon credits between countries was important, even despite concessions to Brazil and others. I think, yeah, sort of my, I think biggest disappointment is the EU and US rejection of the damage fund. You know, the Glasgow loss and damage facility to provide developing countries affected by climate disasters with financial support. Um, but as Natalie said, at least there's an agreement for our process for talks. Um, a, but unfortunately, the drowning nations, which is, I think, a Washington Post article today, the drowning nations are still drowning um, and will drown before anything significant happens, unfortunately. And they, as we read today, are going to take legal action. And I guess in this context of the lack of a um, damage fund, the problem is, of course, that the least polluting, least less developed nations most at risk from climate change are the ones not really getting anything. You think of Africa that contributes only 3% to climate change and yet is going is most massively affected by it. Um, so I guess the big question for me is, will the developed world pay more um, uh, and pay less developed nations? Uh, and perhaps also allow those less developed nations to have a longer period to reaching the targets. I think these are, these are the big questions that haven't been resolved, but I'll stop here now. 
Thank you, Vivian. We'll get into more detail about some of the issues you raised, uh, like the methane gas issue. Um, Alexandros, I'd like to give the floor to you. Uh, good afternoon from Europe and uh, good morning in uh, in uh, Boston, Cambridge. It's uh, it's really great to be uh, at Cambridge even virtually. Um, uh, it's um, most of it has been said already in uh, by various commentators, and I think Natalie and Vivian already basically uh, touched upon the the various key issues. Let me take a, a let me express some personal reflections, taking a bit a little bit of a step back uh, and a little bit uh, slightly different perspective at the beginning. I think the fact that uh, basically uh, 200 countries, basically the whole world, remains on the table discussing uh, uh, and taking decisions about taking action about a global common uh, challenge, uh, threats such as climate change, it's a success in itself. And uh, we should not take this uh, lightly, uh, neither cynically. Um, I think we should not take it uh, for granted either. Uh, we live in a very uh, complicated geopolitical environment uh, in which, uh, which has worsened, particularly after Paris, the Paris Agreement, and the, an environment where uh, not only the pandemic, but also the rise of uh, geopolitical rivalries, the, um, the erosion of belief in multilateralism, or if you want, the belief more generally on international cooperation is taking the upper hand. In a world in which transactional relations and uh, unilateralism, we can call it nationalism in many cases, is, is, is now calling the, the shots more and more. In this environment, the fact that uh, we still have such a global, the only, only global project like this going on, in which all the whole world is sitting around the same table and continuing agreeing on action on climate, uh, on, on, on addressing uh, the climate change, is in itself, uh, in my view, um, uh, a positive uh, aspect. But of course, the question is not about the process. Of course, we have uh, in our hands a very important issue. Scientists are warning us that uh, unless we go down to 1.5 uh, degrees, uh, catastrophe is, 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 is lurking. Um, so we have to address this. The, the fact that we're around the table and we're aware of the problem and we want to address it is not enough. Now, have we uh, done enough in Glasgow? I think already Natalia and Vivian said in terms of uh, the numbers, if you want, the, the mathematics do not add up to uh, meet the, uh, the, the purpose of limiting the global warming to 1.5. But I take two um, wide uh, issues, which I think give me hope that this is in the right direction, uh, the whole process of the, of, of the climate negotiations. The first one is uh, that uh, there was an agreement uh, to, um, uh, to come back next year. There was an agreement to come back next year and not in five years, and by all countries, to review their national, uh, the NDCs, the uh, national uh, emission cuts uh, targets. I don't think we should underestimate the importance of this uh, because we may be in a much better situation in a year from now and closer to the target that we have set for the 1.5 uh, degrees. Second point, which is not directly coming from uh, uh, Glasgow, but I think is sets the context in which all these discussions are taking place. And this is what we can even call a kind of a mini surge over the last few months across the world, starting with the European Union, setting net zero targets. And uh, this uh, is a, it's a wider environment I think we are operating, which I think generates uh, this um, uh, more positive um, uh, uh, attitude across the world uh, towards uh, um, action that hopefully will uh, meet the, uh, the Paris targets and, the, and our objectives. Now, final point impression about the, uh, the, the discussions has been touched, I think, by both Natalie and Vivian, the whole issue of um, the developing and the vulnerable part of the world. Um, this, um, I think this is becoming increasingly a more important part of the negotiations. And I think it will become more important in the next few years. I think this, is, uh, this can potentially be very positive. Uh, of course, uh, on the climate finance, uh, they still, um, uh, we know uh, uh, more to be done. We could have done better. We would have expected to be in a better situation, but partners, uh, Hopefully, they will step up efforts as, as, as agreed. But still, the whole question of climate justice and the whole question of um, uh, not leaving anybody behind, um, it can actually come back and help 
the process of the uh, NDCIs in the next uh, few years. So in a way, there is a link there. The, the more the overall process uh, is inclusive, the more we may be uh, meeting uh, next time around the, the targets we want uh, to meet. And this is a complex process, we'll not go to details, but it was more a comment to say that this issue, I think, uh, we have uh, the, the Glasgow signaled the kind of a shift towards uh, the right direction uh, there, including issues of the adaptation loss and, and damage. And I think we should uh, keep this also as a potentially uh, positive uh, aspects. Thank you, Alexandros, for giving us the big picture and focusing on some of the positive developments. Um, I'd like to look specifically at the EU now. Um, another positive development, as uh, Vivian mentioned, was that more than 100 countries agreed to cut emissions of methane by 30% this decade. And this initiative was, of course, led by President Biden and President von der Leyen, um, beginning with the meeting on September 17th of the major um, economies forum. So how would you all rate the EU's performance in COP as positioning itself as a global actor and pushing its energy transition priorities on the global stage. Uh, Alexandros, you also mentioned climate financing as a, as a major issue. So um, I'll give the floor first to Natalie. Thanks, Erica. And, uh, and let me perhaps kind of use this as an opportunity of kind of putting on the table a, a broader reflection about uh, the EU and its climate leadership. Um, in a sense, the EU is in a bit of a catch-22 here. Uh, in the sense that by far uh, it represents uh, the most ambitious uh, in terms of its plans, its goals, but perhaps even more importantly, uh, the concrete path to get there compared to any other uh, global player. Um, so very clearly it is out there uh, uh, in terms of being, quote unquote, in many respects ahead of the curve. But of course, the snag is that uh, the EU only represents 8% of, under 8% of global emissions. So in a sense, its global leadership uh, is leadership to the extent that there is followership. Uh, otherwise, uh, we may end up being a very uh, green uh, continent um, amidst a very brown world. So that's not going to be of kind of, you know, great, great use. And so I think, in a sense, the conundrum that the EU has been facing, not simply now at COP, but over, over the years, really, is to what extent does it have to, you know, what, what, what's the trade-off here? I mean, to what extent does it have to, question mark, lower its ambition uh, in order to bring uh, not necessarily all the world along with it, but uh, other major global players along with it, uh, and, and, and what is the price, if you like, of the lowering of that ambition uh, with respect to actually achieving uh, the 1.5 goal? Now, you know, I think and sort of, you know, you raise the, uh, the, the, the global um, uh, methane pledge. I think this in many respects indicates a way. I mean, I think uh, that there is, um, there is going to be EU followership to the extent that others follow it. And in particular, if the European Union is successful in working together with uh, the United States. Now we know that um, transatlantic uh, climate relations have never been easy. Um, they have obviously been extremely difficult uh, in uh, moments, uh, particularly during uh, Republican administrations, uh, but even during Democrat administrations, there is still quite a lot of kind of, you know, deep blue water separating uh, the two sides of the, of the Atlantic. Now, I think the Global Methane Pledge indicates how when we actually do agree transatlantically, uh, there, we, 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 what we do is we create a critical mass that makes it extremely difficult for others not to follow. So I think, you know, the, 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 meet, the global methane pledge beyond its value in and of itself has real value in terms of indicating a method. Now, where is it that this method, I think, uh, could and should be replicated? And let me just highlight uh, two potential areas, but which are far, far trickier uh, than methane. Uh, the first, of course, is carbon pricing. Um, so initially, when the EU set out its uh, ideas for uh, a carbon border adjustment mechanism, um, initially, act the, actually, the first reaction in the United States was not necessarily all that negative. In fact, there was quite a bit of interest, uh, particularly at a time in which, if you like, various forms of protectionist uh, measures um, are actually quite in vogue on this side of the Atlantic, uh, too, uh, the idea of the CBAM in the US uh, was not initially rejected. As it became clear, though, 
that it would be extremely difficult uh, for the United States to proceed with its own CBAM, with or without the European Union, without a domestic uh, carbon uh, pricing system. Uh, that is when, in a sense, the sort of tide turned in the US and actually carbon pricing became uh, an element of ton of tension, if not a criminy across, uh, across the Atlantic. However, it becomes very clear that um, carbon pricing will make sense to the extent that it's then extended at the global level. And again, sort of drawing on the uh, methane uh, example, it is really quite important in my view that this is an area where the EU itself um, uh, sort of demonstrates greater flexibility uh, in different forms, if you like, uh, of accounting for emissions and pricing, if you like, emissions, uh, so as to find common cause with the United States. Then there's a second element uh, where I think this is an element where probably greater flexibility on the US side uh, would be of great value. And that is everything that falls under the rubric of uh, green taxonomies. So basically uh, 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 standards, indicators, measurements uh, uh, that are there in order to um, uh, incentivize green investments. And uh, earlier we were talking about uh, the 100 billion um, in, in public finance, but the truth of the matter is that uh, the International Energy Agency estimates that 4 trillion uh, are necessary annually in order to meet uh, our, our targets. Now, between 100 billion and 4 trillion per year uh, lies the private sector, uh, as well as uh, multilateral development banks. And in order for that to happen, you need to have a system of, of global standards in order to incentivize those sustainable investments. Now, on this, the EU is moving forward, uh, and the United States uh, has, in some respects, put um, some stokes in the wheels, particularly as far as the very tricky debate over gas is concerned. So just to wrap up on this, whereas I think that on carbon pricing, moving ahead transatlantically would require probably uh, a dose more of European flexibility when it comes to the taxonomies, I think the same argument holds for the United States. Thank you, Natalie. Vivian? Yeah, that was, that was wonderfully interesting. And so what I'm going to do is shift from the EU outward into the world, but looking at the EU um, as wanting to be a, seen as a world leader, um, in terms of its own ambitions, which are needless to say, ambitious. So the big question is, is the EU up to its own ambitions? Can it be a sort of a world leader, at least symbolically, at least in terms of what it does? And so, you know, for that, we've got to look at what the EU has been doing. The aim of the European Green Deal is for the European Union to become the world's first climate neutral bloc by 2050. And it's got numbers of plans for construction, biodiversity, energy, transport, and food. And I just sort of quickly glanced at the um, commission website. I'm sure we'll hear much more um, from Alexandros, but you know, carbon tariffs, circular economy action plan, emissions trading system, farm to fork strategy, for example, by 2030, 25% um, of EU products should, agricultural products should be organic and there should be a reduction by 50% of pesticides, 20% for fertilizers, food waste should be reduced by 50%. You know, and it goes on and on. There's a forest strategy, um, uh, zero pollution by 2050, on and on. Horizon Europe for research and development toward energy innovation. This all sounds really ambitious. Um, and yet it's criticized by Greenpeace that it's not ambitious enough. The Greens European Free Alliance want the target to be raised at least a 65% reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. I think by 2050, and Greta Thunberg, as we know, Thunberg, as we know, has been talking about all of this is a lot of blah blah blah. Um, at least in terms of the Glasgow summit, but also we've got to ask about the EU: how much of this will be attained or is attainable? And of course, if once we ask, once we look there, we have to consider the internal dissensions in the EU, in particular the Central and Eastern European countries. Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary, uh, also very large emitters, um, are going to find it much harder to make the transition from coal. Uh, 
Poland in particular, which I saw a chart listed, and it's really only slightly below India, Brazil, the US, and China on emissions. It's massive in terms of its emissions. And then if you look at pronouncements by Polish leaders, I saw one that said that that the, argued that the EU was challenging Polish sovereignty by pushing uh, green on it. Um, and, uh, and of course, Poland is actually too dependent on coal to shift quickly. There's also resistance from other populist leaders in Central Eastern Europe, Orban, who has criti criticized, criticized the European Green Deal for you know, many reasons, uh, Babis, in the Czech Republic. So there are problems sort of on the, on the Central and Eastern European side, um, but other member states, there are other issues. So there's been a big push, of course, from Macron in France for the Green New Deal, but also he's been pushing that nuclear needs to be included as green uh, and for clean energy. Um, and the commission has supported that. It seems to me it wants to put it on the safe, sustainable list for green financial investment. But five countries have come out against, Germany, Austria, Luxembourg, Portugal, and Denmark. And we've already seen that they're in Germany alone. There's been real pushback against this, especially from the German Greens, and that are trying to push the new coalition government uh, that's not actually seated yet to, um, to, to not allow nuclear power. And it's important to note as well that the EU, however, is putting its money where its mouth is, not only in the ways that I initially mentioned, but also in the next generation EU, and in particular, the Resilience and Recovery Fund. We should remember that the COVID-19 response, there's 1.8 trillion euros in terms of budgetary and stimulus package uh, seven year, not only the seven year EU budget of 1.1 trillion euros, but also the one off next generation EU program of 750 billion. And basically much of this is actually focused on financing the European Green Deal. It's very strong on, on green, uh, the green transition and the digital trans transformation. And also if we look at the major funding for green in the RRF, 30% plus of the bond, percentage of the bonds emitted are green, while the spending in the RRF is, if I'm not mistaken, 35%, 37% uh, on green and 20% on digital. So I think this is all really important. Um, and then if we look at the National Resilience and Recovery Plans, the NRRPs as they're called, um, um, one might ask, are they actually going to be implemented, given that the European semester that had engaged in oversight in the past seemed to be just rubber stamping or not? Well, now, apparently, this is sort of this new commission-led European semester process is subjecting the member states to real scrutiny. Now that they're getting money, um, so that, but also because the council has the final say and will scrutinize commission decision which means that the commission will have to also be accountable. And, and if we look at the NGEU spending or the RRF spending, sorry, Resilience and Recovery Fund, um, it's actually really interesting to see, uh, and this is for Natalie in particular, 40% of all expenditures are, now, are going to Italy. And Italy is the one taking grants and loans. So in a way, how Italy does might actually then affect perceptions of whether this really works or not. Um, so that's that's another big if. I think the Central and Eastern European countries, I think the four Southern European countries are getting 60% of the money in the Resilience and Recovery Fund and 11 um, Central and Eastern European countries are getting 20%. So this is really important in terms of for both Southern Europe and for Central and Eastern Europe. And, it's also the case that Poland and Hungary have found their money held up because of rule of law issues. So all of this means there's, there's, there's a lot more going on. Um, and I guess how successful the NGEU and the, and the um, uh, Resilience and Recovery Fund are will also have an effect 
on, um, on what happens in the EU and whether it actually can meet its target. So it's really important to see that it's not just EU um, level directives and legislation, but also how are the member states actually going to implement? Because that's really where um, you know, the tire hits the pavement as it were. And I'll stop there. Thanks, Vivian. Alexandris, do you think you could walk us through some of the specifics of the European uh, Green Deal and its implementation questions that Vivian raised? The opposite. Because Natalie and Vivian were um, so uh, eloquent and very clear, uh, Natalie is stressing more the opportunities, Vivian more the challenges, uh, and they are all well known. Um, I would again take the, the long uh, uh, picture. Um, in order not to, to repeat a lot of uh, things that mo most of us, uh, I think, uh, know, and I think we were very clear at the points now. Also because I like, and I agree with Vivian's point that uh, in question uh, about, um, is Europe up to it? And for me, this is not only a question about Europe, it uh, has a much broader implications. Since Europe is the leader in uh, uh, climate uh, uh, politics, the Green Deal is the most advanced comprehensive project of transformation of an economy, society, and politics that any uh, place around the world has ever uh, seen. The 2050 uh, um, uh, net zero objective, it will make Europe the first continent in the world to, be, uh, um, to have reached this uh, objective. Um, and uh, the 55% uh, emissions cut by 2030. And we can go on exactly listing uh, what Natalie and, and Vivian were saying. The ambition is there and is clearly on the top. And if it works, it will have an impact not only in Europe, but in the rest of the world, because it will be sending a very clear message that it can work everywhere. So in that sense, the, uh, the bet is, uh, is bigger than uh, just uh, making it in Europe. It is, in my view, a question of Europe here leading by example and uh, making, making it happen. I think it will have uh, far more uh, implications. I understand there will be other questions later on that we will go uh, through uh, these issues more. So I will, I will um, uh, keep some of my comments for later. Just a, a last point. There is also a great importance, I think, in the role of the European Union in the whole negotiation process from the beginning and still until now. Uh, the European Union is playing a, a key role in pushing for higher ambition, in doing coalition buildings that push in the right directions. The spirit of compromise, if you want, that the EU injects in the, in the whole uh, process, which is essential to keep everyone around the, the table. And of course, the, the additional, uh, beyond the unilateral, uh, uh, let's say, initiatives, beyond the Green Deal, if you want, uh, the additional initiatives like the methane um, uh, project uh, and uh, of course uh, the fact that the EU is uh, giving more than a quarter of the contributing more than a quarter to the climate finance. All these are part, if you want, of of the necessary elements to make the negotiations uh, a, a success. So taking the, the long uh, picture, if we can sustain this by making it by making it happen in Europe and being able to remain this leadership role in the negotiations the next few years. Europe may be playing a very important role in the global efforts uh, to uh, tackle uh, climate change and reach the 1.5 objective, which remains the strategic objective uh, uh, here. Thank you, Alexandros. I'd like to take a second. I see we have a question in the chat already. So I'd like to invite participants to raise their virtual hands at this point if they want to ask a question. Um, Johanna Schiele, I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, if you'd like to ask your question live, please feel free to jump in right now. Um, I think we might have passed the methane point a little bit, so I would I would let others ask questions first. It's pretty specific. Um, thanks. Does anyone else have any questions at this time? I, I actually do. I'm sorry. My question is, is uh, well, specifically specifically for Alexandros, but in general for the whole team. Um, the, you said that the EU leadership would prove that the model is usable and uh, throughout the world and it's possible throughout the world. But the 
the, the do, you, do you really think that what we are doing in Europe is possible in uh, Africa and South America and every, everywhere in the world with the same model? I, uh, Jorge, I, I think you're muted. Uh, yourself. It's possible. I'm sorry. There you Hello? Uh, there have been a lot of problems uh, with this kind of assumptions around the, well, in, in the international arena, uh, assuming that uh, the same process is equally able to uh, democratize every country or to liberalize every economy. It's, it's really difficult to export this kind of, uh, of projects and of models. And it can, and it can create Mm, assumptions that will afterwards disillusionate the countries when they try to have a modernized economy. Uh, you know, it, I, I, I don't see, I see it difficult. Thank you. This, uh, Natalie, would you like to take that uh, question? Um, I, I think this kind of relates back. I mean, it kind of came in, the, the audio was came on and off. So I, I, I think I understood what what the question was about, uh, but if not, Jorge will, will correct me. I mean, I think in terms of, you know, sort of is, is the EU's level of ambition, um, sort of, is it, you know, the model, uh, the path for, for others to, to follow? I mean, is that feasible? Um, I think it's a path. Uh, it's certainly the only concrete path that has been presented. And I think, you know, this is important to, to bear in mind. I mean, uh, around what 80% of the world has pledged uh, to reach uh, net neutrality by 2050, 60, 70, but no one apart from the European Union actually has planned to get from A to B. Now, is this plan going to be replicated uh, in the rest of the world? Uh, well, no, obviously not. Uh, can it be a source of inspiration? Yes, to the extent that the EU itself develops far more significantly than what it has done so far, the external dimension of its Green Deal. Uh, and this is where, in a sense, money in many respects comes back into the picture, because uh, a lot of what Vivian was rightly saying is principally uh, really focused internally on the EU. I mean, this is about making the EU uh, uh, climate neutral by 2050. Um, but these kind of sums are going to be, uh, we will need to be mobilizing them externally as well, uh, if we want to support uh, different parts of the world moving in this direction. And this kind of, I think, requires uh, differentiating. So beyond, if you like, putting a lot more money on the table, uh, it also requires differentiating a little bit in terms of how is it that we plan to use it. Uh, and, and let me just kind of, you know, set out five uh, like categories uh, uh, that I think are important to bear in mind. I mean, firstly, you know, which are the countries where we have to significantly step up uh, our climate adaptation funds? Uh, so far, not only our bias, but uh, the, the, the bias of the developed uh, world has been very strongly in favor of projects of, of climate mitigation rather than climate adaptation uh, projects. Uh, so very clearly, this is an area, particularly if we're thinking about surrounding regions to the EU that are going to be most affected uh, by the climate crisis. The Sahel, Iraq, Sudan are probably the three that uh, stand out uh, most. Uh, towards these countries, not only does climate adaptation have to be significantly uh, ramped up, but it really has to probably start forming the core of the way in which we articulate uh, our foreign policies rather than being an afterthought of our security and development and trade and, 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 and whatnot policies. Secondly, how are we going to be supporting those producer countries uh, that are probably going to be the first that will be affected by our transition uh, because they have the highest break-even uh, costs in terms of production of fossil fuels and they just happen to be the most fragile too. So what are we going to do about supporting Algeria's journey, uh, Libya's journey, Nigeria's journey, given the existing fragilities in these countries? Thirdly, um, how do we, I mean, if we start from the assumption that interdependence um, may not necessarily solve all conflicts in the world, but it does and can act as a mitigator uh, of conflicts, how do we ensure that the interdependences that do exist, including with very complicated countries like Russia, 
rather than being severed altogether, are greened. So how do we green our relationships uh, with existing producer uh, states? And that will also uh, require money. Fourthly, CBAM, uh, the countries that will be most affected by CBAM are in our neighborhood. Uh, Turkey, Russia, uh, Ukraine uh, stand out. Uh, how do we ensure that rather than simply slapping CBAM on these countries' head, we also uh, support them in their transition so as to make CBAM unnecessary? And then finally, to end on a positive note, um, how do we unlock those green opportunities in those currently energy poor countries uh, that could actually become energy rich countries in a green world. And here I'm mainly thinking about uh, particularly North Africa, countries like uh, Morocco and the opportunities that uh, these countries. So all of this will require a lot of money, uh, far more than what is currently earmarked uh, under the Green Deal. Thanks, Natalie. Alexander Sorbikian, do you have anything else to add on the climate justice issues that Natalie raised? Yeah, I think if I understood correctly, the, uh, the question is very legitimate. The question is whether you can replicate the EU uh, model uh, uh, around the world, particularly in the, in the least developed or uh, most vulnerable parts of the world. Uh, of course, uh, there is no uh, answer to something we haven't uh, tried yet. Also, because we are at uh, the beginning of a big process for formation in Europe. The, the Green Deal uh, is essentially um, a new growth strategy. Uh, and this is... Uh, something that uh, we are building uh, uh, with conviction, with support by public opinion, which is very important, uh, being behind this. And uh, uh, certainly, uh, as uh, it was raised earlier on by Vivian, there are a lot of challenges on, on the way. Uh, it's not a, a straightforward uh, um, a situation. And you see, we are in the middle right now of an energy prices crisis, which is, raises these questions in an even more uh, let's say, uh, direct way. Uh, the question of whether the whole uh, green energy uh, transition is uh, well thought out, uh, these questions have come up now, uh, and they are legitimate. Uh, now, again, I go a step back, and the answer would be uh, a new growth strategy in Europe uh, has been, from the beginning, designed together with uh, the idea of fairness, the idea of not leaving anybody behind. So this has its own, if you want, um, uh, parallel, parallel across the world. So uh, we cannot have uh, the same, uh, let's say, strategy for everyone. Even inside Europe, you need and we take very important uh, 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 measures uh, to make sure that nobody is uh, left behind. Now, a third dimension that has been coming up, the one I just mentioned more recently, and I think is something that also has global dimensions, the question of volatility, this question of, the, of this transition needing a, a certain greater predictability, which can be pursued with a number of ways. Perhaps we don't have the time now to, to discuss it, but I think has become, people have become more aware to this risk of volatility and to the need to take action. And I think this will be important inside Europe and the European Union, but I think the success is there will also have a positive uh, um, effect across the world. And I personally see also um, that this has several layers, this uh, need for uh, addressing uh, with um, more, more assertive measures and more clear measures, the imbalances of the demand and supply market, if you want, the market forces and, and, and the demand and supply dynamics. Um, whenever we have this kind of imbalances, you need to have uh, um, solutions to avoid that this becomes, uh, this transition becomes a roller coaster right? and that therefore carries uh, along um, uh, everyone, uh, including, uh, let's say, in the political process. So we don't have a, a derailment because of the political, social, uh, and the economic implications of uh, such uh, volatility. But I think this is not only about the European Union. It's also, for example, about uh, the International Energy Agency, about the OECD countries who can uh, take measures at this level. And then at the global level, the G20 could perhaps be a forum where you can uh, pursue uh, measures uh, of uh, uh, help to stabilize the uh, global energy markets um, and address imbalances. I understand uh, in this long uh, conversation yesterday between President Biden and President Xi in think this issue also it was one of their uh, topics of their discussion, how to ensure stable energy markets, uh, which are essential for the green energy transition to succeed. 
So uh, I think that uh, there, uh, I know, uh, unfortunately, that I widened uh, the answer uh, because there are more issues. I think that the, uh, we are on the same boat, and while we cannot replicate one model to any place around the world, um, I was talking about the more of the growth strategy of the green deal and how this can work. And I think that. Uh, uh, if we continue being all together on the same boat, and that's why I emphasized at the very beginning the importance of the negotiations, keeping the 200 countries around the, the table, I think we have a better chance than uh, leaving everybody on its own, on its own devices. Uh, I think we all know what we're talking about because we have experienced uh, leaving ourselves to our own devices in the context of the recent pandemic, and we see how better is situation when we actually coordinate uh, at, uh, at various levels our actions and responses. Uh, I think this is so evident uh, that uh, I think we are learning from this and, and I hope that it will be applied also here. I hope so too. Vivian? Yeah, so you know, coming back to, it depends what the EU does outside and also inside. You know, coming back to this one question is delivery. It's one thing to pass EU legislation and directives, another for implementation, and especially in countries where um, there's disagreement on the goals. I think importantly for the EU in particular, green is popular. It's important that young people are behind this and the public at large is. We've seen a surge in the Green Party support, for example, the German elections which is further proof, proof that it's popular. And of course, green is very salient as the numbers of floods and storms um, that we've seen across Europe have disrupted people's lives, let alone in the rest of the world where it's been um, dramatic, especially in those less developed countries that are most affected. And so I think the big question is how governments manage the green transition in ways that gain support from everyone. This is about people rural as well as urban, people feel left behind by globalization and Europeanization, and those who are most vulnerable to higher taxes. I think this is really key. Um, but before I get into that, I just wanna sort of jump, on, jump off on something that Alexandros said, which is there's really an important shift in the whole attitude toward how you spend money in the EU. It's the end of the kind of ordo liberal or neoliberal orthodoxy about austerity and structural reform is the only way to deal with um, uh, budgets, et cetera. This is now focused on, really we've seen a turn in the page on Eurozone economic governance, governance. This is about investment for growth. Now one is a lot, the EU is allowing higher deficits in debt, so long as there's good debt I think pretty soon, and hopefully we'll get something like the, that people call the golden rule on investment, um, that adding to debt is fine so long as it benefits future generations. So that means debt um, and deficits focused on um, investing in education, training, research and development, especially greening the economy, digitalizing society and dealing with inequality. But in all of this, the real problem is the rise of populism. The impact and the impact of, the green, of greening the economy on people left behind. And for this, and Natalie had asked me to, you know, especially look at the Gilets Jaunes, but also the rise of the extreme right in France. It's a, a really good case study um, to see, you know, the, the um, uh, Marine Le Pen and the Rassemblement, Rassemblement National, so the um, national rally, claim itself claims to be green, but it's green only in France's backyard. It's pastoral, it's reclaiming the French way of life, but it's totally against any kind of global um, strategies against the Green New Deal, at least that was the 2019 declarations, not only by Marine Le Pen, but others, AFD in the 2019 uh, elections added climate change skepticism to the grid, deriding si the science behind clean air policy as a partic particulate matter hysteria. The Finns in 2019 in Finland came in second place in the national elections with climate hysteria again, at the basis of their um, campaign. Um, highly problematic. The yellow vests are not there yet. 
yet, but but you know, they're multi think about their multiple um, complaints. They were about sense of abandonment by the state, feelings of social isol isolation in the countryside. And the precipitating cause was the fuel tax to reduce carbon emissions, um, which increased their commuting co costs. You know, that what they want is more purchasing power. And I guess the big question for all European countries is, and I think Natalie has written about this, and, um, but, but as well, but it's that governments have already been spending money to support salaries, to support um, um, people who are most affected by rising, now rising energy prices. But how long is this going to go on? And how, and this is really a question for all EU member states, how are they going to manage to keep the population behind them? In particular, when you've got the extreme right, um, the sort of nationalist extreme right that will gain more support so long as the people who are most affected by climate change are not themselves supported by the states. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Vivian. You brought up a, a great point of youth and young people and their involvement in the COP, but also this movement for um, climate global action. So I'd like you to invite the students on this call to please raise your hand, join in the conversation, make your voices heard. Uh, we'll go to Marina Lorenzini next. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for this discussion. Uh, I actually had the pleasure of attending COP last week, um, and I'm a researcher at the Belfer Center. Um, this is really a question for any of the panelists. Um, I would be interested in getting your assessment um, on the impact of some of the COP agreements or statements, uh, particularly on the natural gas or LNG markets. Um, even, I guess, more to geographically focus that, I'm thinking mostly of the developments in Turkey and the Eastern Mediterranean, um, whether, you know, impacts of COP are going to have a significant impact um, on those investments moving forward. Thank you. Thanks, Marina. I know you think about this region a lot, Natalie. Would you like to go first? Yeah, and I'm sure Alexandros will also have something to, to add on this. Um, my, my sense is when we're talking about sort of COP decarbonization and the role of gas, uh, this is really going to be a very differentiated, geographically differentiated story. So I think that whereas um, for the European Union, the narrative of gas as a transition fuel, uh, or gas as is, let me qualify, as a transition fuel does not really fly uh, anymore. Uh, and what does fly or what can fly is, in a sense, decarbonized gas as a transition fuel. Uh, and this is what takes us also into debates, for instance, about blue hydrogen, right? Uh, so I think for the EU as such, um, this is a, uh, it, it has become a more complicated narrative, which to the extent that Eastern Mediterranean gas was originally thought uh, of as a uh, you know, sort of gas to be destined uh, for Europe. Uh, now the debate has shifted quite significantly also because uh, we're moving uh, away from the prospect of this gas being piped, uh, but rather this uh, gas being liquefied and going to international markets, which basically means heading east uh, rather than west. Um, and alongside the fact that uh, gas as is, uh, is a story that continues to have quite a lot of traction. Uh, in non-European uh, areas, uh, so in Asia, uh, obviously in Africa, uh, in, um, uh, in Latin America. But here I'm mainly thinking obviously about Asia. So I, I, I really think it's important to make that distinction. I think gas will continue to play an important piece of the, uh, you, know, you know, part of the transition story, but it will be a very different uh, narrative, gas narrative in the EU and, uh, and beyond. Thank you. Alexandros, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I, I agree. It's a very delicate balance, this uh, transition. On the one hand, uh, indeed, uh, you want as soon as possible, we want as soon as possible to get out of uh, fossil fuel dependence and to um, uh, go to a new dependence, if you want, on time of uh, uh, renewables. Uh, but also to, to increase the energy efficiency, 
to increase our own interconnections in Europe. There's all sorts of other ways in which you can actually uh, strengthen uh, our, uh, our position, our energy uh, security. At the same time, we are aware that uh, uh, this cannot happen overnight. So this transition is going to last for years and, and more. Uh, and uh, therefore, the big and very delicate balance that uh, we have to strike is uh, that the one hand uh, somehow helps the other when somehow they are um, uh, working on different directions uh, in some cases. So in that sense, for some time, we will need also still uh, diversification. Of, of, of sources and, uh, uh, and of uh, suppliers. Uh, and this has broader, uh, uh, I think, implications. It's not only about uh, energy security and supporting the energy transition. It's also about the uh, bargaining power of the European Union vis-a-vis -vis suppliers and others and neighbors. It's also about a greater freedom of, uh, of maneuver. As we know, we live in times where um, um, interdependence is being weaponized eh? uh, often uh, by uh, uh, various actors, and energy is one of these uh, cases. So uh, we will need to continue strengthening our uh, energy security in that sense. And there are there are different also ways. You know, another idea that's being explored is also in the current crisis is also the discussion about uh, voluntary um, collective uh, purchasing of, of gas uh, for uh, gas uh, storage. Um, and there are of course uh, other ideas. We need to I think work uh, more on uh, uh, stress test and strengthen the resilience of the whole. Uh, um, uh, energy system in, in Europe. I think uh, we're, we're learning a lot by the, the current crisis. I personally think that the problem is volatility in itself. Uh, and, uh, and I think there perhaps we need uh, more to do. And again, I repeat, it's not only a European issue, it's a global uh, problem. The, uh, and the global energy transition will not succeed if uh, it becomes a roller coaster um, uh, of uh, price volatility. Uh, yeah, on the East Mediterranean is part of the of the same discussion. I think uh, uh, Natalie uh, uh, said this. Uh, ultimately, as you know, uh, investments are really down to the market, to the companies. Uh, these are the ones who determine uh, technology, as also mentioned, LNG, LNG. All these have transformed the way the markets work, and uh, indeed, uh, it is uh, down to this. Um, but I think uh, Europe uh, has an interest to. And it does actually, uh, in my view, from what I see more and more in all its partnerships uh, with different actors in our neighborhood and beyond, puts the, um, the issue of um, the uh, green energy transition at the center. So the, when we talk about this Mediterranean, the issue is not only about gas. Uh, it's also about uh, electricity uh, transmission uh, from uh, uh, the, um, the northern Africa, where you have a lot of opportunities uh, with, to produce electricity through renewable resources, to, uh, to Europe. So there are a lot of, uh, and then of course there can be uh, know-how uh, from the European Union back. So there is, uh, uh, I think, uh, more opportunities than uh, focusing on the, uh, the gas uh, opportunities, which can also be there as long as the companies and the markets uh, feel that uh, indeed can play their role. Uh, besides the strategic dimension I mentioned, the diversification in itself, which for some time uh, is, will still play a role and have its own importance, I think, for, for Europe. Uh, as for everyone, I think we know uh, you, you don't want to put all your eggs in one basket. I think this is uh, one of the things you learn when you're from very little. So. Uh, at the end of the day, it's not only politics. Also, natural disasters can really uh, make things difficult if you have, uh, if you are dependent in one supply and one uh, route and one supplier. Thank you, Vivian. Uh, yeah, well, I don't have anything specifically to say on, on this in itself, but just listening to um, both Alexandros and um, Natalie, I was just thinking about how important this is for the EU as a project. In some ways, it's really about deepening European integration through greater cooperation, through um, also uh, basically common resources used through common financing through the markets. All of this is an incredibly big leap forward for the EU. 
And greening is really at the center of this as the biggest part of the next generation EU and the Resilience and Recovery Fund. And importantly here, it's really putting money in. Um, it's it's in, instead of basically as in the past, all sticks, you do this or else, there's lots of carrots, there's lots of money um, and, and in some ways, I think that this is really important for the EU, that it pulls it together in a more positive way. Um, and, and I think that positive kind of building of greater integration through greening not only has, a, has an important effect internally, but also externally. I think Alexandro mentioned the sort of the symbolic effect or the sort of the, the power of example. And I think that's where we really are. Um, the power of internally being able to reach agreement and compromise will also, I think, help um, as the EU projects um, its vision, because I think this is really what we're talking about, to the rest of the world. Whether the, how much the rest of the world buy it, buys it, I think um, may be in question, but, but you know, back to um, COP26, Glasgow at least has moved everyone forward to some extent. Thank you, Vivian. I think that is a perfect way to end this discussion. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Um, have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.